over the last 10 years with people who come on to 1632 Tech Quorum on Baines Bar and Post. I've developed a tremendous amount of sympathy for Alexander Pope when he wrote, a little learning is a dangerous <laughs> thing. Because we get these galloping sounds of hoofs and people screaming, Thomas Malthus is coming, Thomas Malthus is coming. Everything will collapse because the population will expand farther and faster than they can deal with. Now, without the benefit of Grantville's arriving in Europe in the 1630s, I'm going to start out with an English example rather than a German one because most people tend to be more familiar with English history. Uh, the basic standard source for English population in the 16th and 17th centuries is still E.A. Wrigley and R.S. Schofield, the population and history of England from 1541 to 1871, a reconstruction. It's been in print since 1981. It's been reprinted over and over. Their best projections, and I'll talk about best projections some more <laughs> later, is that in 1541, the population of England, exclusive of Scotland and Ireland, was about 2.77 million. 1560, 2.96 million. 1600, 4.07 million, 1650, 5.22 million, which means that the English managed to double their population in that century without benefit of any outside help, without benefit of any germ theory, without benefit of improved sanitation, uh, and in, toward the end of it, the middle of a rather nasty civil war. In other words, something happened there that involved none of this, and does anybody want to give a guess as to what happened in England there? To double the population? To double the population. Um, did they overcome a blight that was feeding more people? Or, I mean, there's, no. there's, there's lots of factors that go into it. The authorities lost control over the right to marry, uh -huh. which meant that, that anyone could marry anyone who... could marry at essentially any age. You no longer had to demonstrate that you could afford to support a household in the manner in which the authorities thought would make you a promising uh, taxpayer. The result was younger marriages. And believe me, when you have a marriage in which the groom is 21 and the bride is 18, instead of a marriage in which the groom is 30 and the bride is 27, what this adds is four, children. four to five <laughs> children yeah. per marriage. Also, healthy children. Younger people have healthier children. Yes. And, moreover, you no longer, they were no longer forbidding marriage to people in service, legally speaking. Uh, employers might still object to their servants and employees getting married, but they basically no longer controlled entry to marriage. And in a world in which less than 2% of births were out of wedlock. Entry to marriage controlled fertility. This was the basic truth of it for England. This is also why in the England of this period, the population started expanding so much earlier exponentially than it did on the continent, because the continent was still controlling marriage. Uh, it was still the Germanies, many of them, were still controlling marriages up into the first half of the... 1800s? No, first half of the 1900s. 1900s. If you study American immigration at the ports, at New Orleans, 
at Baltimore, at New York. One phenomenon of immigration was that there were ministers waiting at the docks for men, women, and their children to emerge from the ships and say, I'll marry you. And a fair number of them took advantage of it and got their two or three existing children in uh, wedlock. into wedlock. Right. Uh, because there were still uh, Württemberg, for example, Baden, many places in southern Germany, they were still trying to control the fertility level of the less prosperous portions of the population by figuring, you know, there's one thing about marriage. It really gives maximally convenient opportunities for the begetting of children. Uh, you've got to say that for cohabitation. And if they could you know, insist that the male and the female and the partners, he continued living with his employer and she continued living with her parents, at least they would limit the number of times they could get together and be it. Uh, they really worked at it very hard. So this is something that you're going to look at. To what extent are all the things that people tend to think about, disease, food, and the like, going to affect things, and how much of it is going to be social patterns, how much of it is going to be demographic uh, patterns. Any questions on this so far? Okay, now I'm going to switch uh, over to the uh, Germanys uh, for this period. I have to keep switching glasses, guys, because uh, the glasses that enable to see my notes on the screen turn you into blurs, and the glasses that enable me to see your faces turn the screen into a blur. This is just the way it is. Uh, there are two uh, major authors who have been working on German population in the early modern uh, period, uh, Jan de Vries and Christian Pfister. Uh, de Vries estimates the total population for the Germanys, that is basically the area of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, including Austria Hungary. And Northern Italy. And some well, not northern Italy. Oh, um, well, when I was there, they can't. They well, they the told Tyrol. Me. The Tyrol. They're Tyrol. Well, you count yeah. Tyrol, but Tyrol wasn't in Italy at the time. It was in Austria. It's what we uh, could think of as Italy. Yeah. yeah. Yes. But anyway, De Vries, as using his best methodology and production, figures uh, 16 million for 1600, 12 million for 1650. Uh, Pfister uh, goes a little lower, uh, estimated at 15 million uh, for 1600 and a 10 million after the war. The amounts, the precise amounts differ by a million or so in either direction, but the relationship is the same. Most of the decline came in the second half of the Thirty Years' War, from 1634 to 1648, when it went completely out of the management of larger military and political entities and turned into a guerrilla bloodbath for all practical purposes. This is one of the reasons why Eric picked 1631, 1632 as his starting point for the series. The worst of the devastation in the Germanys had not yet occurred population-wise. Uh, the population had survived the plague epidemic of 1624, 1625. The plague epidemic of 1635, 1636 hadn't hit yet. And as we go into the next series of stories, uh, part of it, uh, my novella and his for the Wars on the Rhine, 
uh, deal with the attempt to use the methodologies of quarantining against plague that were known and practiced at the time for the entire western and southern border of the USA. In other words, take what the doctors knew how to do for an Italian city-state, a German imperial city, the measures they used, and apply them to an entire front uh, to try to keep the periodic sweep of plagues from coming into the Germanies, from coming into the U.S. city on this particular outbreak to contain it uh, where it hits. This, at present, may or may not uh, be successful. However, it's one of those things. It's, been, it's one thing we have to deal with. Uh, Walt is going to talk to you now some about epidemiology and the impact of epidemics. One of the things that um, Grantville brought back to Germany was a pretty sophisticated understanding of what makes people sick. Um, it's a very sophisticated understanding that starts with the germ theory of disease and moves through basic sanitation practices um, and into what we now call epidemiology. One of the things that Eric has been having the, communi the, the uh, committees of correspondence do um, for several several series years now um, is to enforce where they control or have strong influence in a, in a city or region to enforce basic sanitation like don't crap in the basement uh, um, don't throw your slops in the street right cholera wash, measures wash your hands well yeah but see here's the thing yeah cholera wasn't there not there no cholera London. didn't come around until right around the turn of the 18th century or the 19th century rather um there was no such thing as cholera this is going to be real interesting in a is, minute but it it all works for typhus too it does and typhus, typhus was there typhus and was uh, there. influenza and almost so, else. Um, what, uh, so Grantville brought back, wash your hands, wash your face, wash your don't, clothes, don't wipe your butt with your hand, um, stuff like that. That was basic sanitation that they could teach without um, lots of, without lots of, uh, of pushback uh, from the communities. Because you can see right away, um, the, the, re, the reaction, the result from basic sanitation isn't necessarily very quickly a population increase, but what happens is the population gets less sick. People don't get sicker. And here again, you have to keep in mind that the, it, part of the issue is not only total population of what you might think of it, national or proto-national area, but also the distribution of population within that 